I want to welcome you this morning. Uh, so glad that you are with us uh, today. Uh, for those of you who may be new with us, uh, we have embarked uh, in, in a series called The Separation of Church and Hate uh, over the last four weeks. And uh, one of the reasons why we decided to go into the dicey territory, right, of talking about politics in church is because we believe that our culture needs it and that Jesus has something to tell us uh, today. And so we're going to finish this series with this topic of unity. So we're going to get right to it. So if you have your apps, I'm going to make a statement, and I hope that you uh, will understand where I'm coming from. Here's what, what this statement is. Nothing divides like politics because nothing divides like fear. Now, what exactly do we fear? See, you realize that a lot of what you know, drives politics is driven by fear. If you listen to any of the national conventions over the last couple of weeks, you're going to realize that a lot of what people say in politics is driven by fear. Now, what do we fear? We fear the loss of control. We fear the, the, we fear the loss of opportunity. We fear the loss of progress. You know, sometimes when this becomes racially charged, you know, white people may fear what might, ha what might happen. Black people say they fear that what has already happened. We fear the unknown, many different things. But uh, I want you to make sure that in, in the purpose of this, this, starting like this, is because I want us to, to, to not be driven by fear. As our church grows, I hope that it doesn't look all the same personally, and even maybe even politically, it's not going to look the same. The goal of this series is to teach us to disagree politically and personally, but love unconditionally. Now, don't say anything yet. Don't throw anything yet, even more importantly. In fact, the best way to throw stuff at the preacher is through the app. Okay, you watch it later. You throw all, anything you want all over there. But now, I want you to, to know this. Um, I know that you probably think, hey, I got this. You know, I got this. I can love people no matter what. Um, and this is the question that we have been asking over the last four weeks. Um, are you willing to put your faith filter ahead of your political filter? Are you willing to put your faith filter ahead of your political filter? Now, you know, again, the temptation is to say, yes, I can, I totally can. You know, I'm good. I'm good for this message. But I'm going to ask this question again in a different way. Here's what this question means. Are you willing to evaluate your politics through the filter of your faith Okay, through the filter of your faith, rather than create a version of your faith that fits your politics. That's another way of asking the question, is are we willing to filter our, our politics through the filter of faith first? Here's another way of putting it. Okay, are you willing to follow Jesus when following Jesus creates space between you and your political party, your party's platform, and your party's candidate? Are you willing to follow Jesus? And, you know, in Jesus, sometimes we'll ask you to create some space. And that is difficult for some of us because of the way that we grew up, because of what we were taught, or maybe because of the hopes that you have in the party, in the platform, or in the candidate. And that is going to be difficult. Over the past few weeks, we've been challenged to model our lives and, and to act, you know, with civ civility, you know, to treat people with civility, with dignity, to not remove the value from them. You know, with, with humility to say, let's look at ourselves the way that we really are in our conversations and interactions with others. Uh, however, this week, we're going to shine the light now on the role of unity in God's church for us to be able to accomplish His, His purposes. Now, the problem is that we live in a divided country, right? Andy Stanley says, he talks about three dynamics that have caused great division. Here are the three dynamics that have caused great division. The first one is that everything is politicized. I mean, just, you know, you don't have to go super far. You know, just one swipe away or one click away in your phone, and you can realize that everything has been politicized. School openings have been politicized. Protests have been politicized. The virus has been politicized. Wearing masks, mask wearing has been politicized. One of my favorite, Anthony, Anthony Fauci has been politicized, right? Like, three, four months ago, Republicans, you know, loved him. Now, Democrats claim him. I mean, it just keeps changing, so everything has been politicized, and that has caused great division. Sometimes it's not even about the issue. It's about what that issue symbolizes. Here's the next thing. There is a cancel culture. Here's what the cancel culture is that's going on right now. That if you say anything that I disagree with, I discount everything you have ever done in the past. 
If you say anything that goes against something that I really care about, it discounts you know, any authority that you may have in the issue. And that's called the cancel culture. And we sometimes experience that as well, right, in, in, in Christianity. In fact, there are great examples. Who hasn't heard of that family or person you know, that leaves the church because of one sermon? You know, and, and you know, when I talk to people and pastors, it's like it usually, you know, it starts the conversations usually start like this. Like, I have loved this church. Or we came to this church years ago, and this church helped our marriage, helped our kids. You know, we really love the passion this church has for the community. And you go, and you're like, okay, this is going to be a pretty good conversation. And then what happens? But you said this one time in one sermon, thus we're living. That's cancel culture. Okay, so it doesn't matter everything that we believe about, you know, this church stands for. Because of one time you said something, you know, we're going to cancel everything else. Here's the last thing. That causes great division. Yeah, this is not as well known, but in some circles it's called culture war Christianity. This is a version of Christianity that is consumed with winning, by winning. It requires an enemy for its sustainability. You know, it seems like it thinks that everything is against it. It sees perpetually under attack. It defines itself by what it stands against instead of what it stands for. It's fueled by fear and just the, the loss, fear of losing something. You know, and it sets up to the church to be a tool used by politicians rather than becoming the conscience of the nation. And, and it doesn't represent what Jesus taught at all. When it comes to Bible teaching, I want you to know this. You know, let's take a little, just make a little parenthesis. Uh, Harvester in our church is conser- it's a conservative church. And here's what it means. I'm going to explain what the, I, I mean by that. I mean that when it comes to seeking the truth, we go to the Bible. We go to the authority of the Bible. Because here's what happens to determine what's moral, what's right, what's true. Because here's what happens if you don't. If you don't go to Scripture when it comes to seeking truth, you're going to end up with a majority morality. Now, when we let this happen, this, when we let the majority determine what's right, you know, sometimes that's going to change. When we let culture determine what's right, that may change. And you know who suffers most when we do that? It usually is women and children in cultures because truth has changed so much and they're always the recipient of all the anger and the violence that happens because of it. But, uh, but I want you to know that even though uh, we always look for scripture, you know, to Scripture when it comes to finding truth, you know, there are going to be some times when we d- disagree in, in different things. But with culture war Christianity, what happens is that you can guilt people into doing things. You can sell people fear if you, if you are far right or far left. But I tell you what you can't do there. You can't solve problems there. You can't love people well there when you're in that, in that position. And you won't find Jesus there more than likely. The church always looks more like Christ when we are defending others instead of, you know, the other people's rights rather than our own rights. The church always looks more like Christ when we are giving away instead of demanding our way. And I want you to know that and think about this. Here's why. Because we don't always win by winning. Sometimes we win by losing. We need to understand that, church, that we, you know, is this world against, you know, God's truth sometimes? Yes, it is. Are we going to experience the anger and the outrage of the world not liking some of the truths of Scripture? Yes, we are. But are they always against us? we got to make sure that we don't come, you know, become this church with a, a culture of war, that everything and anyone is against us all the time, and that makes us lose our witness. Uh, listen to, let's go to a, an instance where you can kind of see this same attitude from one of the, a couple of the apostles, Luke 9, 51. Through 55. This is toward the end of Jesus' ministry. So they've been with Jesus for a while, okay? And here's what happened. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. Again, someone else didn't have their faith filter right before a political filter. So they didn't welcome Jesus. And that's what happens when you don't have your faith filter first. And so they didn't welcome him. So when the disciples James and John saw this, that Jesus wasn't welcome, they asked, Lord, 
Do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? This, guys, is what happens when we buy into this culture war Christianity. We all of a sudden become, you know, we're fighting against the world when Jesus came to save the world. And, and we know they wanted to call down fire from it. Do you want us to use the resources that we have, Lord? Do you want us to use, to leverage our power to win? It becomes all about winning. But what did Jesus say? Let's just keep reading. But Jesus turned and rebuked them. Jesus turned and rebuked them. And so how's Jesus going to build his church if he doesn't take power, if he doesn't win? Are you saying, how are you going to you know, build your church if you're going to be arrested and crucified? And we are tempted to ask the same question. And Jesus said, that's exactly how I'm going to build my church, by being arrested and crucified and being resurrected. The question is, are you going to follow me through that? It's going to be my way, not your way. I'm going to win. Sometimes we win by losing, not always win by winning. Can you imagine the impact God's people would have if regardless of the outcome this coming November, we didn't engage in this culture of outreach? I want you to know this, church. Your political candidate will win or lose based on how American citizens vote one day in November. And the fact that I can say this, you should feel blessed because there are countries where democracy is just, you know, put on. It's, it's a facade. So the fact that we can still trust in this phrase, I think, is important. However, the church will win or lose based on our behavior every single day between now and then. Based on how you and I act is how the church is going to win. Based, based on how you and, and, and I act is whether the community and maybe possibly the nation will win or lose because they will lose, we will lose the witness that we have in our community if we cannot put our faith filter before or ahead of our political filter. Jesus knew this would happen, and so he actually prayed about this. He didn't pray about the election. He prayed about division within the church. Let's go to John 17. John 17, 1, 11, I'm sorry, says, I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world. He's talking to his disciples, his apostles. His apostles. The apostles are still in the world. And I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. So, so John says, protect them by the power of your name. Now, he's not asking for physical protection. In fact, we know most of the apostles ended up being martyred because of their witness. We, he didn't ask, you know, for physical protections. He didn't say, Father, protect him from any physical threats or pain or suffering or discomfort. He was actually praying for one thing. He said, so that they can be one. Protect him from division. Protect him from splitting. I want him to be united just as you and I are one. At the end of the day, Jesus was most concerned with unity. And then he keep, keeps on going. And he also prays for us. Switch over to verse 20 through 23. He says, my prayer is not for them alone. Not only for the apostles. I pray also, listen, for those who will believe in me through their message. That means you and I. That means anyone who would believe in Jesus because of their message. That means the church today even. That all of them may be one, Father. Just as you are in me and I in you, may they also be one in us. So the world may believe that you have sent me. So the world may believe that you have sent me. It is, it is interesting that he says not even, he didn't even say, you know, people are going to believe in me because of uh, miracles that will happen. They will be believe in me because of the signs that I'm going to show them and do through people. He said they'll believe in me because, you know, they are one, if they are one. And so then he keeps going. He says, I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you send me and have loved them even as you have loved me. So the way that we get people to believe that, Jesus, that God sent Jesus and that he loves us is that we can be united. My guess is that a uh, few of us have probably asked that in our prayer requests, right? How many of us have said, hey, I have a prayer request that we can be one as a church. I have a prayer request that we would be more united. It's not something that really we usually think about. 
but Jesus is telling his disciples, my time is coming to an end here on earth, and I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray that your unity is protected. And since Jesus gave unity such a high value, we must not sacrifice unity for anything or anybody. Since Jesus gave unity such a high value, we must not sacrifice unity for anything or anybody. And the question is, what about us? Do we value unity as Jesus valued unity? You know, what negative, divisive adjectives have you assigned people who have different views from yours? Uh, Nate Johnson talks about how we create division. He says that we create division by putting people into boxes, by giving people an adjective that puts them into a box or maybe different boxes. And when we do that, we create division. It's like saying the Republicans are redneck, gun-loving, greedy. You know, and some of you are saying amen, right? And then we say the Democrats, okay, are arrogant, tax-loving, you know, socialist, and you just preach it, preacher, okay? And then independents are vegan, conflict-avoiding hippies. And everybody agrees, right? If you don't agree with me politically, you know, you are dot, 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 and you put them in a box. And then all of a sudden, you know, you can't hang out with them. We can't be friends. You know, we, we may be. I don't even know if you're a true Christian if you, if you, you know, vote different than I do. So this creates a culture of division, but not only division. This creates a culture of contempt. Matthew Lake says this, that contempt comes from a Latin word, contemptuous, meaning scorn. Scorn means, you know, we believe something is worthless or, or disgusting, despicable. Now, contempt and anger mixed together is like mixing ammonia and bleach, right? It's, it's bound to be explosive. And so the question is, have we treated someone with contempt? You know, we were talking about this earlier in one of our messages. Contempt is towards the view that you have of people. You know, our emotional, our mental, our spiritual attitudes are just changed by contempt towards others. And sometimes even, you know, towards people within the church. In the book... Uh, Leadership and self-deception, the authors talk about how when we are in the box of contempt, we view others as objects, you know, as threats and obstacles to what we want to accomplish. You know, our needs and wants are greater than the other person's needs and wants. You know, and we consciously resist people outside the box. And so what we need to do is we need to learn to live outside these boxes of, of division. You know, today someone said, you know, there is a contempt problem, not only an anger problem. And when someone treats you with contempt, you never forget it. It's like that is just the way, you know, it, there is just a little bit of disgust and detachment, and people just treat you differently. And so today, if we want to solve this problem of division, we got to attack the problem of contempt. I'm going to tell you, Christianity does not stand in any boxes. No single box is big enough to hold the cross of Jesus Christ, his sacrifice, his resurrection, the promises that he gave us, and the power of the Holy Spirit to transform us. All of that doesn't fit into the box, so we need to decide, do we stand in the boxes, or do we stand on his cross? Living outside the box leaves us with a door open to truly loving. And I, wanna, I want you to rem, you know, remind you of this, and I've probably said it once or twice already, but I want to make sure that you, you understand this. It isn't American politics that shaped the Western culture. It is the unique, unique upside-down message of Christianity that ended up you know, shaping the Western civilization. It was the teachings of Jesus that, that we're trying to go after today that actually shaped civilization. So since we always don't get it right we need to make sure that we don't, you know, miss the mark. During the short history of our nation, there has been both political parties have gotten it wrong, right? In fact, there are several parties that turn off the lights. You know, the Whigs, the Federalists, you know, they don't exist anymore. Since we don't always get a ride, why would we put our trust on anywhere else other than the teachings of Jesus? Even George Washington warned about the division that we're experiencing today. Let's read this quote. And he's talking about political parties. You know, it, it agitates the community with ill-founded jealousies and false alarms. Man, you listen to the news these days, that sounds, you know, rather familiar. Kindles the animosity of one part against the other. Torments occasional riots and insurrection. It opens the door to corruption, which finds a facilitated access 
to the government itself through channels of party passions. Man, that sounds just really familiar today. So why would we, followers of an eternal king, allow ourselves to be divided by temporary political parties and be divided by lesser kings driven by fear? So the question is this. We need to ask at some point ourselves, right? How do we make it practical? How do I promote unity? How do I promote unity? Here's the first thing I want you to just think about. Look for an opportunity to love unconditionally someone with whom you disagree politically. How do I promote unity? Look for an opportunity to love unconditionally someone with whom you disagree politically. Now, you may say, but pastor, I don't know anyone with whom I disagree politically, and that is the problem. If you're asking that question, that would be a problem. You say, everybody that I, you know, that I know agrees with me, that's a problem. You need to intentionally go find someone who you disagree with and love them unconditionally. Joni and Nangsar Morse, which are some of our own missionaries in Thailand, they said, you know, they send new, uh, newsletters sometimes via email, and they sent one just, you know, a couple months ago. And they talk about this idea of God's kingdom, you know, love and, and just the unity and just kind of the upside down nature of God's kingdom. And so I, it just really hit me when I read their newsletter, and I just saved a portion of that, and I'm going to read it to you. This is just from their newsletter. Missionaries in Thailand, okay? They know exactly what it's like to suffer for the name of, name of Jesus. And so here's what they said. However, this kingdom cannot be entered and fully enjoyed unless we're willing to embrace its protocols. So God's kingdom has protocols. Our old nature will need to be checked in at the door. Once inside, there really are only two rules. Love God and love one another. Once those house rules have been understood, the creative possibilities for each one to exercise their gifts in God are limitless. Oh, just one more thing, they say. There is no room in the kingdom for bickering and infighting that stem from self-importance. One could say that this is another rule, but really, it really isn't because it just doesn't happen in the kingdom if you follow the first two rules. Anyone who wants to engage in that stuff has to go outside the kingdom. And this is what I want you to understand. Anytime that you are choosing lesser things to divide you from your brothers and sisters, you know, with a greater purpose, you're walking and trying to step outside the kingdom. He says, after a while, each person decides where they would rather spend their time, inside or outside. Most of God's children get the message pretty quickly because it can be quite horrible outside. These are people that are, you know, people that we support at Harvest. They're people that, you know, are in ministry on in and out, and they understand the importance of unity. And so what we need to really understand is, you know, here's the, the other possibility that you're thinking. Okay, so we're, you know, a few minutes in. We're almost finished, but here's what, where you may be at this point. You may be like, hey, preacher, you know, that's your job to say these things. That's their job as missionaries to, you know, advocate for these things. But it's kind of naive to ask that everybody will live this way, right? You know, let me ask you this. Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Was that naive? When Jesus was standing in front of idol worship that seemed to be never ending, you know, and to see, seemed to be going nowhere, he said, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of Hades, the gates of this idol worship will not overcome it. And maybe the disciples thought it was naive, but Jesus did build his church in the gates of Hades. The doors of Hades have been under attack by God's church ever since. But when we think that things are naive and we don't do our part, and we start trying to leverage the tools of the kingdoms of this world, we look paranoid, and we just look weak. And that is no witness to be part of God's church. I'm going to tell you, as an American citizen, vote for and stand up for your rights and freedoms as, as granted by the Constitution of the United States. Please do so. In fact, you should vote and you should keep your, you know, moral standards given by the law of Christ, you know, and use those to help you discern. However, when we speak and or ask, act as the body of Christ, we need to do it not in an order to win. We need to do it so that people will see that we love them like we have been loved by God. That's why God's church should never align with anything or anyone else besides Christ. And I mean both corporately 
but also individually. You shouldn't line up with anything else other than Jesus. You gave your allegiance to Jesus. Remember, at the waters of baptism, those of you who have been baptized, you said, I accept Jesus as Lord, which we sometimes kind of oversee, and Savior. We love the Savior part. Jesus saved me, but Lord means he's in charge. I, I'm playing my, my pledging my allegiance to you, Jesus, first and foremost. And we need to remember that pledge that you, you gave Jesus. When we get distracted and align ourselves with anything or anyone else, we miss a great opportunity. You're going to break bridges that are, God is putting in front of you so that you can lead people to find and follow him. Here's the, la- the second thing. So we need to look for an opportunity to, look, to, to love someone. Here's the next thing. Live out culturally disruptive unity. Live out culturally disruptive unity. You know, in the first century, the church said, we're only going to worship Jesus Christ. We're not going to worship the emperor. Even the good ones, there were some good emperors that said, we cannot worship the emperors, not even the good ones. This is why the empire decided to oppress Christianity for a while. And, and I tell you what, just as disruptive as the message was, there was one thing more intriguing. It was the church's unity. All of a sudden, classes of people that, you know, whose circles rarely overlapped, they were gathering together. You know, the, the freed with the slave, you know, the people that had money with the poor, men and women, people from different cultures and different backgrounds gathered together regularly to worship the crucified God, the crucified Jesus, and the resurrected Jesus. And that cultural disruptive unity shocked the world, and Christianity became contagious. A crucified rabbi whose ideas of love and unity turned the, up, turned the world upside down. This is why we cannot divide over party lines, knowing that those parties will eventually be deleted or changed. So we need to live out this culturally disruptive unity. And here's the last thing. Pray for your church. Now, why pray for your church? Because I don't want us to be so consumed by what we can't do that we miss what we can do. I tell you, November is going to happen, and whatever is going to happen is going to happen. And some people will be really frustrated, and some people will be really happy. And I don't want God's church to be so consumed by that that we miss living out our mission. I'm gonna, here's a couple of things that you can pray for. Innovation. You can pray that we become innovative, that we always think outside the box, that we can say, how can we reach people? Even in a time when gathering together is difficult, it's, and, you know, and people don't always know what to do. You know, I want you to pray for influence. How can we influence people? You know, and, and become, you know, just a good influence in our society, in our community, and then impact. How can we truly make a difference in people's lives? I, I would love for people to come to Jesus, even in the midst of everything that's going on, you know, today. And here's the prayer that you should always have. Heavenly Father, make us one so we can influence many. When people see that we have a, you know, a, a diverse group of people here, but yet we can come together in the name of Jesus, we can influence many. So I'm going to ask you to say this with me and just pray with me. I hope that it comes from your heart. But just say it with me as we say it. Heavenly Father, make us one so we can influence many. Let's say it again. Heavenly Father, make us one so we can influence many. We need to remember this. A handful of disorganized, socially outcast men preach an outlandish message in Jerusalem. And they started preaching in the name of Jesus. And to the surprise of the whole world, this message, you know, just took over and came to change many lives, including many sitting right here in this room today. And if this message hasn't reached you yet, hasn't changed you, I'm going to ask you, you know, you have an opportunity today. I'm going to give you an opportunity here in a minute to say yes to Jesus, to the power of his resurrection that can transform you. And, and I bet if we get this right, perhaps, perhaps, you know, if every church in America can get this right, perhaps the nation will be a little bit less divided. But we can't worry about the whole. We, can't, we only have to worry about our congregation here and our community here and let God do the rest. So it is my hope that in an age where outrage and division run so deep, we can be of one mind, 
We can be of one mission. We can have one allegiance to Jesus Christ alone so that the world can see a difference in us. And when they step in and look, because we look so different, they can find the one and only who can change also their lives. Would you pray with me? God, thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ. It is, Lord, because of him that we stand today, Lord, and worship you. It is because of his sacrifice that we enjoy forgiveness of sins. And so, Lord, let us love your church the way that he loved your church, Father. Let us be able to be united and bring people together, Lord, instead of driving people away from us. And, Father, as we do this, would your name be glorified and would people see that you love them as you have loved us. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. As we get ready to worship, um, I get it sometimes, you know, it's hard to hear a message maybe that is uh, so different than what we have heard before. And I want you to know that many of you, maybe it's difficult to hear, you know, messages like what we've been preaching lately because maybe you have put your hopes in, you know, maybe government or maybe a political party or a system. And you think that if that disappears, then everything else, you know, will follow. And uh, I'm going to tell you what, if you, that's the case, I know that you have been disappointed. I know that probably, you know, it was sincere belief, but you have been disappointed, and you will be disappointed. Because there's only one person that can completely give us the peace of mind, and it's not a system, and it's not a government, and it's not a country. It's Jesus that can give you peace of mind. It is not, maybe some of us do it because, you know, we feel that if our economy is secure, then we'll be able to find peace. And I'm going to tell you, it's a lie. You won't. Again, it's only Jesus that offers peace. So during this time, if you have never received just Jesus as Lord and Savior, you can do it today. We have the baptistries ready to go as well. If you have received them and just haven't been baptized, you know, we want you to know we have, you know, an opportunity to do it. For the rest of us, if you're a follower of Jesus, would you just pray right there where you are? You can come up front, and, and we have also prayer partners on each side of the room. And just simply Say, God, will you continue to work in my life so that I will love your church and this community the way that you do? Let's stand up and let's pray and worship.